Hey everybody, it's Lisa Marie here. Hi, my sweet lifers. I want to apologize to you guys because we skipped a week. Last week I was in Florida catching deliveries for our second home that we've got down there that we're setting up. We've rented a place for a year and I'm kind of testing the waters to see what's going on. There's a lot of cool stuff happening down there in Florida. Um, I'm going to mention a little bit of that little story behind that, behind the scenes uh, during this episode. But we're back on track, and today we're doing for the Sweet Scoop, we're working on Chapter 10 for our study guide that we're working on through Knowing God with J.I. Packer. And I went ahead and selected a couple of the questions from the study guide and made some notes so that I can go through that with you guys and kind of get us back on track with regards to what we're working on with building our theology. So, a little update from Seminary World finished up biblical theology while I was down in Florida, um, had a 15-page paper for the final that I did on the kingdom of God and the covenants and the universal covenants with Adam and with Noah and then the national covenants with uh, Abraham and Moses and David and then the new covenant in Christ and uh, I'm waiting to hear back about the grades on that, but I feel good about it. So I feel like, you know, it's probably going to be an A, so hopefully it is. And I'll keep you guys posted on that. Started a new semester with no break this time because it's fall. Um, and this semester I'm working on the prophets. And I went ahead and took a little tiny peek at what we have for writing assignments. And it's pretty extensive. The final paper is due December the 2nd. And it is a full-blown uh, Sunday school type Bible study that I have to write for the entire book of Isaiah. So I'm really, uh, I'm going to have to be digging deep. There's a lot of prophets that we never got preached on, both in the Baptist church and the Episcopal church. A lot of books of the Bible that are in that little window of the prophets that when I went and looked in the library uh, yesterday to see if I had what I needed for that because I have obviously I've got multiple Bibles here in the house but there's a sermon series that has a sermon guide and it's kind of a preacher's guide that goes through every single line of every single scripture and helps you develop future you know sermons and things um, and it really goes back and forth with a lot of detail um, on each scripture and so I have been as I've been going along through seminary buying the books that we're working on at each point um, and I had barely any of those. I had uh, Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Isaiah but I didn't have all the others so I'm waiting for that to get here as well. But anyway, so chapter 10 is all about God's wisdom and our wisdom and some of the questions that are in this book study guide um, is the purpose of this particular chapter is to understand God's gift of wisdom. And when I was going through this, guys, it's actually really interesting. Um, and, it, and Packer mentions it as well. Ecclesiastes is like a really great book um, in the Bible to teach us exactly this. So we're going to go a little bit into that. But I went ahead, like I said before, and made some notes so that um, I'm not flipping back and forth in the book. Some of this is directly from Packer's book. Some of this is just me going back through and answering the questions. But the first question is, what is the difference between an incommunicable and a communicable attribute? And so then he, he asks in the study guide, name some attributes of God that fall into each category. And so I went through and answered this question. So the old Reformed theologians used to categorize God in two different ways. Or he would like figure out, they would figure out what are the things about God that are only attributes that God has that he has not given to humans and what are the attributes of God as as us being his in his image and image bearers that he has given to us that we share and so the first group is the incommunicable and they're the ones that are different from humans and so things like he is self-existent um, he's immutable freedom from all limits of time and space, simplicity. There's no conflicting elements in God. of God. He doesn't have to make a choice between right or wrong. He's always right, right? Um, he's eternal. He is omnipresent. 
these are all in, incommunicable because we don't share these as humans with him. And then you've got the communicable that theologians have pulled together that are like God's spirituality, freedom of moral attributes, goodness, truth, righteousness. When God made man, he communicated these qualities to us. But then when, and he gave us free will and spirituality to be in fellowship and worship with and for him. But when Adam fell, that disconnected us with our relationship with God. And so all throughout the ages, which is what I talked about in that last paper, is king, the kingdom and the kingdom works as God is constantly trying and working towards spreading his kingdom throughout the world and communicating and becoming in more fellowship with us and getting our hearts aligned with him to obey him and be loyal to him and 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 all of those things and the inner workings of the kingdom both on earth and in heaven all the moral qualities were stripped of mankind when adam did sin and god has been throughout history repairing and renewing it so when you go into this book if you've bought this book and you're following along in the study go check out chapters one through nine in proverbs because that gives you a really solid kind of um, basis for understanding seeking out wisdom and understanding the differences between what we are given and granted to have as wisdom in our earthly bodies as humans and and how god has bestowed that information to us as well as the differences between why god is so much greater higher um, and has so much more knowledge obviously because he's created the whole entire operation so uh and, and there's that so proverbs one through nine is homework um and then there's an emphasis that god is willing to give wisdom to those who seek it and are willing to do the work to receive it from him so for those of us that are building theology going to seminary not even necessarily going to seminary but just taking the time in our daily lives to read scriptures and try to understand what it's trying to teach us uh, the more that we seek, the more we will find. And God promises that to us. So it behooves us to do that on a daily basis, which we'll discuss here in a little bit as well. Number two, one of the questions in the study guide was, what two steps must a person take to lay a hold of the gift of wisdom? And how can we do this day by day? And so the answer, according to Packer, is there are two prerequisites according to the scriptures. First is that we must learn to fear the Lord. Not until we realize how minuscule we are in the grand picture of God's kingdom can we begin to distrust our thoughts and be humble before the Lord and teachable. We must stand in awe of exactly who God is and what he has done and continues to do for us, and only then are we prepared to be shook and given divine wisdom. So the first thing is realizing that we don't have it together and that God has all of it together and that all the glory and all of the praise and all of the trust and faith in living in this earthly life needs to be given over to God and into his hands and trust in his hands and that we are just a tiny little itty bitty bit of the whole entire grand picture. The second thing that Packer says is we must learn to receive God's word. Wisdom is divinely wrought in those and those only who apply themselves to God's revelation. Um, and this is a Psalms quote, your commands makes me wiser than my enemies, declares the psalmist. I have more insight than all my teachers. Why? For I meditate on your statutes. That's Psalm 119, 98, 99. Paul admonishes the Colossians, Colossians, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly with all wisdom. That's Colossians um, 3, 16. How do we do this? By soaking ourselves in scripture, which Paul told Timothy, we are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ, and to make us thoroughly equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 15, 17. How many times have I quoted that in papers through seminary? I can't even tell you. The Cranmer's Prayer Book Lectionary, which all Anglicans are meant to follow, will take one through the Old Testament once and the New Testament twice every year. How long has it been since you've read right through the Bible? Are you spending more time on social media than you do reading your Bible daily? Packer states, what fools some of us are. And we remain fools all of our lives simply because we will not take the trouble to do what has been done to receive the wisdom, which is God's free gift. So throughout the scriptures and studying the scriptures, meditating on the scriptures, spending time in the Bible, reading the Bible from front to back is how we gain wisdom. Is how we understand God's kingdom and what God has planned for us and how God has prepared the earth 
and how God is prepared to get back to us close in relationship with him through repentance and through the Savior, Jesus Christ, as well as his plans for the new heavens and the new earth and our resurrected bodies forever, eternally worshiping and with him. So in order to understand the whole inner workings of the kingdom of God, you have to study the entire Bible. And it's all in both the old and the new. It's not just in the new. A lot of times Christians will think that the Old Testament is not for them stuff from the past. They don't understand how to relate to the Old Testament. They think it's like the old and it's like abolished and gone. But Jesus actually says that not one dot of the law is going to change. He's come to fulfill it. So it's very important to understand that we have to understand the old and the new and how it relates to each other and how it is not only applicable for the people in the day that it was written, but also how it applies to our daily lives now. So that's part of building your theology. Number three, what wisdom is not? What does having this gift of wisdom not mean? So Packer asks this question, and so this is his answer. People think that if they are truly walking close to God, that they would have some supernatural insight into the purpose for everything. They would come to understand why certain experiences in life have happened to them, and they would be clear at every moment as to how God was making all things work together for good. Many people spend a lot of time pondering over their pasts and contemplating if they should start or stop doing their lives in a certain way. Many end up baffled. It is true that God will conform, confirm a correct direction by proving unusual situations, providing unusual situations, which will most likely be so obvious as to which we can hardly deny it. And so this is where I want to stop and talk about Florida for a little bit. So as you guys know, you know we've been in Texas for the better part of over 30 years. And our home is here. Our lives are here. The studio is here. Our, our entire community is here. Uh, but, you know, over the, over the past, like, three or four months, we've gone back and forth to Florida. Uh, a friend of mine that's been on the channel twice asked me to go and stay in her house and hang out for a little bit and do a couple little errands for her because she was in a different home and away. And while we were down there, we just absolutely fell in love. I mean, it's just beautiful. It's got great big pine trees that are like North Carolina. It's got the ocean like Mexico, clear blue water, gorgeous, just gorgeous beaches, powdery white sand, Nothing like we've ever seen before. And we'd spent most of our vacation time in Mexico. And so when I saw the beach in Florida, I told Brian, I was like, this is just absolutely gorgeous. Um, and it would be a really lovely place to consider retiring, if not just having a vacation home. So we just stuck our big toe in there, just a little dip. And we put together a rental property for a year. And, and you know, I don't know what that's going to turn into. It may turn into full throttle move into Florida. It may turn into being in Florida and being in Texas for the next several years back and forth. But in any case, that's what we've been doing for the last month or so, which is again why I missed last week's uh, Sweet Scoot because I pre-taped a couple of episodes and got down there and just got busy and, and didn't tape anything. And so that's why we're catching up today. But when I was down there, guys, I was planning on going to a nail shop that was down the street where my friend's house is. And I decided to not do that. I decided I was going to go to the one that was closest to this house that we've rented. And I walked in there like noon on a Friday and they were really sweet. Um, and this lady was sitting on the couch and I started talking to her. Her name is Shelly. And I started talking to her and we visited for a little bit. And then she said, well, we've got a women's uh, artist network that we haven't met since COVID. Uh, but we're going to meet today at the public library, which is right down the corner from your house. And I want to invite you to come and be a part of the group and introduce you to the group. Uh, and I had shared with her that I was a painter and a photographer and a writer and all that. And that I was going through seminary as well. And I shared with her about the channel and whatever, you know, me. So I went, I thought, okay, this is an opportunity that's been given to me that I absolutely had not planned for, like literally not even planned for. And so I went to the public library, went and got my little tray of apples and cheese and pretzels so I could contribute to the potluck and showed up at the library like two hours later and met 23 lovely women. All of them are working artists. They're connected to galleries all over Walton County um, and was just welcomed with open arms. And it was so interesting because I had been praying about finding a group of women, a group of people, uh, not particularly women, but a group of people that were in the art community 
there, and I had been thinking about uh, back going back into painting because I do not want to set up a whole nother studio in Florida. That's like a whole nother hoopla. I do not want to do that. I don't mind my families that are in Houston coming down to be photographed, um, you know, on the Emerald Coast while we're down there, here and there, because the water there is so much prettier than it is in Galveston. I mean, it makes for absolutely gorgeous photos. Uh, but I don't want a studio down there. And so the fact that I was placed immediately into the hands of these 23 ladies that were just so welcoming and so connected to the gallery community was not a coincidence. I mean, and then before we started to have our food, they started to pray. And I just almost fell into tears because I was like, oh my goodness, the Holy Spirit has given me immediately a group of women, immediately a Christian group of women who were connected in a way that I was thinking was how I was being led for the next things that I'm supposed to do, which is paint, and particularly paint in the Garden of Eden, which is down there about 10 miles away from our house. And it's a beautiful, you know, state park that's just loaded in places to paint. Squirrels, lake, flowers, gardens, water little uh, water feature, you know, cherubs and things, a 600-year-old oak tree that people go and get married under, uh, just an absolutely gorgeous place to be and to paint. And and there he had just laid it right in my lap. And I said that all but just basically said that exactly to the ladies. And one lady was funny. She said, oh, Elisa, that's the fastest I've heard from the Holy, you've heard from the Holy Spirit and I've heard from the Holy Spirit ever like you know you asked for something and it got delivered immediately and so that's what i think packer's talking about here whenever you have you go through life there's certain circumstances that happen to you that you know you're in the right place at the right time for the right reasons and you've been led that way and you can't deny it it's not something that you can say oh well, it's just a coincidence no if i had gone one hour later i wouldn't have met shelly and shelly had to invite me because it's an invitation only group and it was that day, that Friday, and they hadn't met at all since before, you know, right at COVID. And so it had been three years since these wonderful ladies had met. And they were all, you know, just hugging and kissing on each other and loving on each other because they hadn't had a chance to see each other since all that had happened. And for me to be a part of that and be invited to be a part of that was really special and absolutely a gift from God. So that's what he means by that. And that's what I wanted to share with you about the situation in Florida. So number four, the question is, what does it mean then for God to give us wisdom? So what is this gift? What kind of gift is it? Packer says it's like being taught how to drive, and it involves the appropriate response to life as it is happening around you and to those that you love. You don't ask yourself the why it is happening. Rather, you simply try to see and do the right thing in the actual situation as it presents itself. The effects of divine wisdom is to give you the ability to navigate properly through the ups and downs and twists of everyday life. To live wisely, you must be clear-sighted and realistic. We must not walk around living in a dream or disillusioned of what we are experiencing, but rather a down-to-earth and clear-headed approach. There is one book in scripture that's especially and specifically designated to turn us into realists, and that is the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes means the preacher, and it is a Solom Solomonic exposition. The author speaks as a mature teacher giving a young disciple the fruits of his own long experience and reflection. So Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 11, 9, 12, 1, and 12. What the preacher wants to show him is that the real basis of wisdom is a frank acknowledgement that this world's course is enigmatic. Much of what happens is inexplicable to humans, and most occurrences under the sun bear not outward signs of rational, moral God ordering them at all. He warns against the quest for trying to understand life completely. He says, look, you see death coming to everyone sooner or later, but coming haphazardly. Its coming bears no relation to whether it is deserved. 7, 15, 8, and 8. Humans di die like beasts. 3, 19, 20. Good ones like bad, wise ones like fools, 2, 14, 16, 9, 2 through 3. You see evil running rampant, 3, 16, 4, 1, 5, 8, 8, 11, and 9, 3. The wicked prosper and the good don't, 8, 14. Seeing all this, you realize that God's ordering of events is inscrutable 
and as much as you want to dissect it and understand it, you can't. In doing so, it makes you fall into helplessness. So you begin eventually to ask yourself, why even bother? If life is so haphazard and senseless, what exactly is the point? What use is it working to create things, to build a business, to make money, even to seek wisdom? For none of this can you do anything obviously good. 2.15 through 16, 22 through 23, 5.11. It will only make you an object of envy, 4.4. You cannot take any of it with you, obviously. <laughs> 2, 18 through 21, 4, 8, 5, 15 through 16. It is precisely in this spiral of pointlessness that optimistic expectations of finding divine purpose of everything will ultimately lead you. 1, 17 through 18. The world we live in is a place that he has described, that he has described, the God who rules it hides himself. Rarely does it seem that there is a rational power running it. Fact, face the facts first. See life abound up in sin as it really is. All of this should not make us apathetic or joyless, but rather circle us back to the following. For the truth is, God in his wisdom to make and keep us humble and to teach us to walk by faith has hidden from us almost everything that we should like to know about the provincial purposes which he is working out in the churches and in our lives. So then what is wisdom? Fear God and keep his commandments, 12.3. Trust and obey him, reverence him, worship him, be humble before him, and never say more than you mean and will stand to when you pray to him, 5.1-7. through seven. This is Packer. Do good, 3.12. Remember that God will someday account, take account of you, 11.9.12.14. So eschew, even in the secret things of which you will be ashamed, when they come to light at God's throne, 12.14, live in the present and enjoy it thoroughly. 7.14, 9, 7 through 10, 11, 9 through 10. Present ple present pleasures are God's gifts, are God's good, good gifts. Seek grace to work hard at whatever life calls you to do, 9.10, and enjoy your work as you do it, 2.24, 3, 12-13, 5.18.20, 8.15. Leave to God its issues. Let him measure your ultimate worth. Your part is to use all the good sense and enterprise at your command in exploiting the opportunities that lie before you. 11.1-6. through 6. This is the way of wisdom. It is a walk in total faith. We can be assured that God who made this marvelously complex world order, who encompassed the great redemption from Egypt, and who later compassed the even greater redemption from sin and Satan, knows what he is doing and is doing all things well, even if for the moment he hides his hand. So then wisdom is choosing the best means to the best end. God's work of giving wisdom is a means to his chosen end of restoring and perfecting the relationship between himself and humanity. It is not a sharing of his knowledge, but a disposition for us to confess humbly who God is, and that he is wise, to give him our whole heart, daily in all that we do, in our words and acts and deeds, live for him alone despite any and all circumstances that we may find ourselves in, and in doing so we feel the effects of his gifts of wisdom. We are more humble, more joyful, more godly, more able to conform to his will, and less troubled. The kind of wisdom that God waits to give those who ask him is a wisdom that will bind us to himself a wisdom that will find expression in a spirit of faith and a life of faithfulness. We must dedicate ourselves to cultivating our faith and trust and not a wasted pursuit of seeking to find knowledge, which in this world we are not meant to have. So in chapter 10, basically we are saying, Packer is saying, God has created all of it. All of the world is his. And there are specific things that we're meant to know and specific things that we're not meant to know. And that we are to study the scripture, meditate on the scripture, show reverence to God, worship him, be faithful to him, and put all of the trust of whatever's going on in him. And in exchange for that, what God does, and I'm, I can attest to this, despite whatever circumstances that you're going through, whatever circumstances that I have gone through or will go through, when I stop and put all of my faith and trust in the Holy Spirit, and ask for him to give me calm and peace and just 
leave it to him, I am overwhelmed with a sense of peace. I no longer worry about what's going to happen. I don't think about what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't worry about what happened in the past. Only in the present, at all times faithful, constantly trusting in him, putting all of it into his hands. And you will live a peaceful, joyful, calm, albeit you will not know the answers to everything because we're not supposed to. And that's the point. That's the point of chapter 10. God has his place. We have our place. He's given us what we need. And what we need to do is put our faith and trust in him. So I hope that this has given you a little bit of insight more deeply into building your theology. Constantly working on this book uh, with Packer has really congruently given me an opportunity to build mine even deeper. Going back over it again and again because we studied this like two semesters ago. And as we're going through this chapter by chapter, I'm going backwards in time a little bit with what I've already done for school. But there's always a new nugget. This book is really, really good. So I encourage you to get it. I encourage you to follow along. By the way, another big, big uh, announcement for the channel. We reached 1,000 subscribers, which is just a wonderful thing. I'm overjoyed. Um, so keep sharing it. Keep telling people about it. Uh, Please do, if you do, like it and share it. You know, ring the bell, get notified, uh, and let people know what's going on. This is a different channel than what it was when it started. Uh, obviously, as I'm growing in my faith and growing through seminary, things are evolving as well. I'm still cooking. I'm still doing a little bit of gardening, and I'll still share some of that stuff and decorating, of course. But it has shifted its gears completely and almost fully into building the kingdom of God. So I am really thrilled about this channel getting a thousand subscribers and I'm excited to be able to be back with you guys this week as well. I hope you've enjoyed this sweet scoop and I look forward to seeing you guys next Tuesday. Stay sweet.